Hello everyone, in this video we're going to investigate the range of a projectile along an inclined plane. So our setup is just illustrating this diagram here. We've got a Cartesian coordinate system whose origin down here coincides with the starting point of our projectile. We've got a straight line which is an inclined plane making an angle alpha uh, to the x-axis. Then we've got our projectile being launched with an initial velocity such that the initial speed is a u. Um, and the velocity vector initially makes an angle of beta to the inclined plane itself. So in the first instance, what we want to do is find an expression for this um, red length that I've marked as r, which I'm defining to be the range of the projectile, find an expression for that in terms of the various parameters of the problem. Once we've got that, we'll think about how to choose beta optimally to get the biggest possible range. I should also mention that we're going to be neglecting air resistance in all of this, otherwise we're going to end up with equations that we can't solve analytically. Now this equation that's just appeared is an equation that gives the shape of the trajectory of our projectile. There's one quantity uh, in that equation that I'm going to need to define on the diagram, which is the angle theta that's appeared there. Uh, theta is basically just the angle that the initial velocity makes with the x-axis. So it's that angle there. You can see straight away that theta is alpha plus beta. Now this equation can be derived fairly straightforwardly by applying the SUVAT constant acceleration equations in both the x and y directions and eliminating uh, the time variable. If you'd like to see all the details of that, then I have a video that you can uh, have a look at. However, we're going to use this equation as our starting point for this video. So if we're trying to determine r using this equation, um, if we call this point uh, p, the point where our projectile hits the inclined plane, then the first thing we really need to know is the, the coordinates of p, and that comes down to finding the intersection of a curve in a line, right? The, the intersection of the trajectory with the inclined plane itself. We already have an equation for the trajectory, so we just need to come up with an equation for the inclined plane. Now you can do that by making a little right angle triangle as follows. I'm going to just draw a horizontal line like this, and a vertical line um, like that. So there's a 90 degree angle here. And I've just made that triangle um, such that the top corner um, coincides with some arbitrary point on the inclined plane. Uh, so the horizontal bit of the triangle uh, is just the x-coordinate of that point, and the vertical bit of the triangle is the y-coordinate. And you can see straight away um, from that pink triangle, uh, it follows that tan of alpha is just y over x, which you can then uh, rearrange for y to get y equals x tan alpha, um, which is simply the uh, the equation of our inclined plane. So then at point P, let me just write this down, at point P, we're basically solving uh, the two equations above simultaneously. Um, and this works out quite nicely because they both have y on one side. And so we can just equate the right hand sides of the two equations to each other. So we get x tan alpha from the second equation is equal to, well, I can just copy and paste all of this stuff and put it as the right hand side of my equation there. So if we can solve this equation for x, um, then we'll be able to use that to get our range. Now that's a quadratic equation in x, we've got this x squared here, and you can see by inspection really that x equals zero is going to be a solution, right? You just substitute x equals zero and you get zero equals zero on both sides and therefore zero is a valid solution of the equation. Um, that's not the interesting solution because that just tells us that the trajectory intersects the plane at the starting point of the trajectory, which is a fairly um, well, self-evident statement. So what we can do um, is focus on the other solution um, for which x is non-zero, uh, meaning that we can basically just divide this equation by zero, right? Because that's the solution we don't care about. And then we just get tan alpha equals tan theta minus gx, not x squared anymore, over 2u squared cos squared theta. In general, you need to be careful about doing this sort of thing, dividing an equation by some factor, because you might miss a solution, but we already spotted that zero was a solution. So this is okay in this case. So in fact, it just comes down to solving a linear equation. We just rearrange that equation above. We get x is 2u squared cos squared theta over g um, times tan theta minus tan alpha. Don't be tempted, by the way, to say that because um, beta is theta minus alpha, tan theta minus tan alpha is tan beta. You can't combine the tans in that way. If you wanted to do that, you'd have to use some uh, some trig identities, but we'll just leave it in this form for the moment. Now this, of course, is just the x coordinate of point P. What we really want is the length of that red line, r. Um, but r follows straightforwardly from x, actually, because imagine making a right angle triangle whose hypotenuse um, was that big red side and the other sides um, were parallel to the x and y axes, um, then you can see that r is just going to be the square root of that x value squared plus the y coordinate of p squared. Um, 
And we sort of already know the y coordinate because y is x tan theta, and we have an explicit expression for x now, right? Uh, and so we may as well substitute y in terms of x in that little Pythagorean expression there. Keep the x squared as it is. Um, y squared is just going to be x squared uh, tan squared alpha. So then you can factor out the x squared that they have in common and take the root of that and pull out a prefactor of x. And then under the square, you're going to be left with 1 plus tan squared alpha, uh, but then you can use the trig identity that 1 plus tan squared alpha is sec squared alpha, and then you root that and uh, you just get x sec alpha. So then we can just sub our expression for x, this one here, into an expression for r, which basically just means times x by sec alpha. Um, so we're going to end up with r equals, we've still got our prefactor of tu squared over g from x, I'm going to write my cos squared theta factor separately here. Remember that sec alpha means 1 over cos alpha, so I'm going to put a cos alpha on the denominator there, um, and then you've got this bracketed um, tan theta minus tan alpha term. Um, then I'm going to apply another trig identity. First, let's just write the stuff out. It's going to say the same. We've always got our tu squared over g. Um, I'm not going to do anything with the cos alpha in this step, but we've got two factors of cos theta on top, because it's cos squared theta. I'm going to keep one of those factors where it is, so keep one cos theta there, and multiply the other one into the brackets. The reason I'm going to do that is because we can apply the identity that sine theta is tan theta times cos theta, and so this first um, term in the brackets is going to be sine theta. Our second term, well, we've got different angles, so we can't do much. We'll just leave it as uh, cos theta times tan alpha. So let's see how much simpler we can make this expression look. I'm now going to apply that same identity, tan is sine over cos, but for alpha rather than for theta. Right? So I already applied it once for uh, for a theta term. I'm going to take this tan alpha and just replace it with um, sine alpha um, over cos alpha. And then I'm going to factor out this cos alpha on the denominator and put it in front of the bracket. So let's see how that works. We're of course still going to have our 2u squared over g cos theta, but now we're factoring out the cos alpha from the denominator, so it's going to be cos squared alpha in front. Um, because we've done that, we also have to multiply the first term in the brackets by cos alpha. So we can write that as sine theta cos alpha, and then the second term, because we factored out the denominator, uh, is just cos theta sine alpha. Now if you're familiar with your trig identities, you'll recognize sine theta cos alpha minus cos theta sine alpha is just the expansion of sine of theta minus alpha. And if we apply that identity, we can rewrite this as one nice big fraction, 2u squared um, cos theta, and then just a sine of theta minus alpha, and all of that over uh, g cos squared alpha. But remember that the original parameters of the problem were not theta and alpha, but alpha and beta. Right? Theta was a parameter that I introduced at the beginning because it was convenient to write our uh, equation of the parabola in terms of theta. So as a final step, we better do a transformation of variables back to beta and say that beta is theta minus alpha. And then we're going to get 2u squared. Well, there's going to be a sine beta on top from um, sine of theta minus alpha. And then your cos theta is just going to be cos of alpha plus beta. And um, nothing changes on the denominator. It's still g cos squared alpha. So we've got our expression for u up at the top there. Uh, one thing that's worth checking at this stage is just seeing what happens when alpha is zero. If alpha is zero, you get 2u squared sine beta cos beta over g. In that case, of course, theta is the same as beta, right? Because theta is alpha plus beta, and if alpha is zero, then theta and beta are the same. Um, that expression, 2u squared sine theta cos theta over g, uh, is the standard well-known expression that we get for the range of a projectile on flat ground. So that's reassuring. Now, the other point I wanted to address in this video is how to choose angle beta, the launch angle optimally for the biggest range for a particular given value of alpha. Now, to figure that out, of course, we need to partially differentiate our range um, with respect to the angle that we're varying, which is beta, so dr by d beta. When we do that, uh, well, nothing's going to happen to the alpha term, right? The cos squared alpha on the bottom. So we can just keep a constant prefactor of uh, 2u squared over g cos squared alpha on the bottom. Um, now, uh, we're going to have to use the product rule on the top. We differentiate sine beta with respect to beta. You get cos beta. Um, and then you keep your cos of alpha plus beta as it is. And then you do it the other way around. So you keep the sine beta as it is. And you differentiate the cos term. But cos differentiates to minus sine. Um, and so uh, we're going to have minus sine of beta um, times 
sine of alpha plus beta and close those brackets. Now there is a pattern in the big square bracketed term that allows us to apply yet another trig identity. And to make that clearer, think for a moment of uh, temporarily relabeling beta as some other variable, let's call it capital X, uh, relabel alpha plus beta as capital Y. And of course you have to use the same symbols for the other term. So cos X cos Y minus sine X sine Y is just the expansion of cos of X plus Y, which really means cos of beta plus alpha plus beta, which is the same as cos of alpha plus two beta. So this entire bracketed term um, is just cos of um, alpha plus two beta. So if we're interested in getting the maximum possible range, let's say at the maximum, uh, of course your derivative has to be zero. So cos of alpha plus two beta um, has to be zero since the prefactor can never be zero. The first time that happens is when the argument of the cosine is pi over two. So alpha plus um, two beta is pi over two. Now, of course, mathematically, there are infinitely many solutions to cos of alpha plus two beta is equal to zero, but we're gonna stick to considering the case where alpha lies in the first quadrant, where it's between zero and pi over two. Um, just try to visualize what happens in the diagram. If alpha were to get bigger than pi over two, then you would end up with a situation where um, the projectile was always below the, uh, the plane and therefore they would never intersect. So we just care about this first solution. Remember, we're considering alpha to be fixed for a particular problem. So we really are interested in making beta the subject of this and that rearranges straightforwardly to uh, beta is pi over four minus alpha over two. Again, you can see um, as soon as you set alpha equals zero, you recover the, the well-known um, result for the uh, range on a, on a horizontal ground that you have to launch it at an angle of pi over four. Uh, which is 45 degrees. I think it's actually quite nice to um, rewrite this in a slightly less simple way um, as pi over two minus alpha all over two. Now, the reason I think that's um, a little bit illuminating as the meaning of this result is that the angle pi over two minus alpha, I'm just gonna draw that on the diagram, uh, it's the angle between the inclined plane and the y-axis, right? Because x and y have an angle of pi over two between them. So if we're taking pi over two minus alpha and dividing that by two, that's saying that the optimal launch angle is the, well, it's halfway between the the plane and the y-axis. And what's special about the y-axis? What is the direction along which gravity acts? So the nice symmetry of the solution is in fact uh, retained regardless of the value of alpha. You always have to launch it um, along the bisector of that orange angle there. So that's all for this time. Thank you for watching and see you again soon.